If there's one thing that's on all of our minds today, it's this. Time. Our calendar is running out. A new year is about to begin. If you're like me, your thoughts today hover between the year that's behind us and the expectations for the year that's to come. And that's really pretty normal because we're people. We're stuck in time, as it were. But today on Through the Bible, we hear about a miracle not often talked about in this holiday season. Pastor J. Vernon McGee ministers to us with the eternal Word of God, pointing us to a Savior that, yes, did come as a baby to a Middle Eastern town in a century long past. But more importantly, his story began long before the manger. In fact, he existed even before time itself. Dr. J. Vernon McGee will explain more today about the man who lived before he was born. That's the intriguing title of his message that we'll listen to now. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we stand before you today in time, but we focus on eternal things, things outside of time. You are the eternal one, and we submit our days to you and ask that you would speak to us now through your word. In Jesus' very precious name we pray. Amen. Our subject is the man who lived before he was born. The man who lived before he was born. And may I assure you at the very offset that this subject is not a riddle or any attempt to make a riddle at all. There are four high points in the earthly and human life of the Lord Jesus Christ. The virgin birth is first. Second, his substitutionary death. Third, his bodily resurrection, and fourth, his visible ascension. These four are familiar facts to Bible believers. These four are facts that are accepted by every person who believes that the Bible is the Word of God. In Christian circles, we're accustomed to speak of Christ living after his death. In fact, he's the only man who died and rose again in a glorified body. He is today the first fruits of them that sleep, and there's no other quite like him today in that. He is the only man living in glory today at God's right hand. And we always pick up his story at Bethlehem. And when we pick up his story at Bethlehem, we follow that little baby as he grows to manhood to the cross, and then into the tomb, out of the tomb, forty days, and then he ascends back into heaven. And then we speak of him being this morning at God's right hand where he is. We are always accustomed of looking in this direction. I'm wondering if this morning we can turn around and look in the other direction, the opposite direction. I'm wondering this morning, instead of beating that familiar path to Bethlehem, we can take that trip to Bethlehem, and having taken the trip to Bethlehem, we just go right on through Bethlehem. We go right through that stable and we go out on the other side and we keep going out yonder into space into the endless ages of eternity past. That's what we're going to try to do today. We're going to try to turn around and we're going to try to go in the other direction because in this direction, there is a vast, unexplored territory. There are unfamiliar scenes to us here. There are strange sights. The fact of the matter is, this is the new frontier. And if you're not tired by now of the new frontier, 
May I suggest that this is the new frontier that we can look at today. We're going this morning in the opposite direction. We'll not go to Bethlehem. We'll not go to Nazareth. We'll not go down by the Sea of Galilee. We're not going to walk through the narrow streets of Jerusalem. We're not going out to Golgotha. We're not going to look in at the empty tomb. We are not going to the Mount of Olives and see him go back to heaven. And we are not this morning going to attempt to see him yonder at God's right hand, the man in the glory. Micah already pointed this out to us. He says, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth, who shall be ruler over my people Israel. That doesn't end. Whose goings forth have been from of old, even from everlasting. He didn't begin at Bethlehem. He began back under in the eternal ages of the past. Before Jesus was born in Bethlehem, he lived in heaven. He gives us the movement in the Gospel of John. In fact, this is the movement of the Gospel of John. He said on one occasion in John 16, 26, I came forth from the Father and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and I go to the Father. That's the movement. Out of eternity into time, as John Wesley said, God contracted into a span and back out into eternity. But we won't go with him back out in eternity this morning. That direction, we want to go back yonder. And today, we want to see the one who lived in heaven and see what he did before he was born in Bethlehem. It can be said of no other man that he ever lived in heaven. He told Nicodemus, No man hath ascended up into heaven, but the Son of Man that came down from heaven. And one translation, which is very good at this point, has it like this, No man excepting myself ever was in heaven. No man excepting myself. He's the only one that can go back of his birth and say, I was in heaven. Now, our Lord is unique in many respects, but there's none that sets him apart from other men more than this truth. He lived before he was born. Oh, we go into the nursery and look down at the little baby and we say, Where did you come from, baby dear? And the nursery rhyme says, Out of the everywhere, into the here. That's all right for the nursery, but it's only of him you can say that. Out of the everywhere, into the here, he lived before Bethlehem, if you please. May I point out something in passing? The problem of the liberal preacher and the avowed agnostic is not the virgin birth. Before long, you will hear several radio preachers explain why they do not believe the virgin birth. They always do. I'm sure they'll do the same thing this year. May I say to you that their problem is not the virgin birth at all. And their problem is not the miracles that he performed when he was here 1,900 years ago. The real problem is this. Do you believe that Christ is in the Old Testament? Do you believe he existed before Bethlehem? May I say until you can answer that question, all right, you don't even need to discuss the virgin birth. That's the one that has to be settled first, my beloved. It's not the Jesus of the, of the New Testament that causes the difficulty for men today. It's the Jesus of the Old Testament that causes the problem. It's not A.D. It's B.C. And the interesting thing is there's no such thing as B.C. B.C. means before Christ. Would you tell me when that was? 
before Christ. He said, before Abraham was, I am. You've got to go back past Abraham at least. There's no such thing as B.C., not with him. You can't go the other side of him. He comes out of eternity. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ is the theme of the Old Testament as much as he is the theme of the New Testament. There is more of Christ in the Old Testament than there is in the four Gospels. Yes, there is. The Lord Jesus Christ is in the Old Testament in a twofold way. He's the theme of prophecy. That's the reason the Old Testament is a hymn book, H-I-M book. It's all about him. And there, there are over 330 prophecies, 330-plus prophecies concerning his first coming. They were all literally fulfilled. And I do not know how many concerning his second coming. I would say there are five times that many. I do, I do not say I can do this, but I believe he's on every page of the Old Testament. I didn't say I could find him there. I wish I could, but I believe he's on every page of the Old Testament. He is the theme of the Old Testament in anticipation and prophecy. That's the first. Second, the Old Testament contains the historical record about him also, long before he came to Bethlehem. You have him in the Old Testament in anticipation. You have him in the Old Testament in manifestation. You see him in action in the Old Testament. Now, all agree, even his enemies from the very beginning, agreed that he was a great teacher. When the first ones were sent out to get something on him, they came back and reported, Never man talked, is this man talked. Never man spake, is this man spake. So he's a great teacher. And today those who deny his deity, they say he's a great teacher. Well, then if he's a great teacher, let's listen to him. Let's hear what he has to say on this particular subject. And he gave a discourse on bread. He knows more about bread than Helms knows about bread. And he gave a discourse on bread. Will you listen to him as he talked about bread? And I'm just going to lift out several verses here. In John, the sixth chapter, verse 33, For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven and giveth life unto the world. Now, will you listen to him? He's teaching now. He says that he is the bread of life and that he came down from heaven. You can't say that this morning, friend. No man can say that. And in case you missed it, he wants to repeat it. Back down in verse 38, For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Have you listened to it? You may have missed it, even the second time. So he said it the third time. Verse 41, The Jews then murmured at him, because he said, I'm the bread which came down from heaven. Now the enemies understood in that day that he made that statement. They, they understood it that way, too. And then he had to keep on going. You might have missed it again, so he wanted to say it again. Verse 50, This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. He didn't mind repeating, did he? So he said it again in verse 51. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. I'll give my body, he said, as a sacrifice in order that you might live. And I've come down from heaven for that purpose. I have come down from heaven. Will you listen to the great teacher? He 
He repeated it. He reiterated it. He went over it again and again and again. He said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. Now, you can't get bread like that anywhere else. May I say that that's not the only place he talked about this matter. Will you listen to him again in John 8, verse 58 and 59? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. Now, notice the reaction. Then took they up stones to cast at him. Why? Because anyone that would say that was making himself God. And they thought he blasphemed when he said that. And friends, if he was not who he claimed to be, then he did blaspheme. He made himself God. Before Abraham was, I am. Then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself, went out of the temple, going through the midst of them, and so passed by. And I think his exodus there was a miracle. He's not through. When he comes to the end of his life and he goes to the Father in that great high priestly prayer in John 17, and he turns in his final report before he returns to heaven, the report where he says, I finished the work thou gavest me to do. He went on and he made this request, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory I had with thee before the world was. I'm returning back to heaven. I have finished the work you gave me to do. And as I return... Return to me the glory that I had with you before creation. So the Lord Jesus Christ taught that he lived before he was born. Now, there are many appearances of him in the Old Testament. I want you this morning to see him in action. And it's at this particular juncture that I feel frustrated. May I say that if you want to stay here, we can stay here till sometime tomorrow afternoon and turn to the appearances of Christ in the Old Testament. But I don't know about you, I don't think you would stay that long, and I don't think my voice would hold out that long either. So let's not do that. I want to lift out this morning three stupendous undertakings before he became a babe in Bethlehem. I want us to see him this morning occupying three offices that only God can occupy. No one else. Only God could do this that he did. First, he is the creator. Did you understand what I meant by that? He is the creator. I turn back to Genesis 1-1 and I read, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The word for God is Elohim, it's plural. Actually, I think it means three. It's not dual. Hebrew has dual. It's not dual. And when a number is not put with a plural word in Hebrew, it would mean three. In the beginning, Elohim. God created the heavens and the earth. Now, let me be very frank with you this morning. God has told us precious little. I wish he'd have amplified that. I wish he would have at least put in a few pages on geology and a few pages on cosmology. I wish he'd have put in a few pages on biology. I wish that he'd given us some detail, but he did not give us detail. Because God is not interested in Genesis and teaching you any one of the sciences. He's merely trying to inform you concerning the fact that God created the heavens and the earth, and that's all in the world he's telling. And if you get anything else there, he didn't say it. All he said is, he created the heavens and the earth. But when I turn over to John 1.1, 1, 1, I find out, who it was that did the creating. It was the Lord Jesus Christ who was the agent of creation. Will you notice this? 
For John 1-1 goes back past Genesis 1-1. In fact, Genesis 1-1 is, comparatively speaking, recent. It couldn't have been over, oh, a hundred billion trillion years ago. Couldn't have been back past that, I'm sure. And you can move it back that far if you want to. But that's, comparatively speaking, that's recent for God, who's the God of eternity. He's got plenty of time. You don't need to worry about trying to cramp him in a few thousand years. He's got, he's got billions of years back of him. And you can put creation back anywhere you want to. But when you come to John 1.1, 1, 1, you're up against a problem. The problem here is this is a beginning that has no beginning. This is a beginning that when it was beginning, it was. It was already past tense. And when it began, it didn't begin because it meets you, coming out of eternity. He meets you. In the beginning was the Word, imperfect tense. Uh, the Greek had an aorist tense, and when they wanted pinpoint action, they didn't use a past tense, they used aorist tense. He didn't say, in the beginning, pinpoint was the Word. In the beginning, imperfect was the word. Continued action. In the beginning, what beginning? For the life of me, I don't know. I can't go back there and put down a point. It's back of Je it's long before anything was created. It's before Genesis one one. John one one goes farther back than any verse in the Bible. In the beginning was the word. That's the first thing that's told was the Word. That Word is Christ, the Logos. He's so identified. The Word, the Logos, was made flesh. And He is the one that from now on can tell you the Word. I am. The one that appeared to Moses, I am, is now. I am the Word. What Word? I'm bread, He said. I understand something about God. I'm life. I'm the vine. I'm truth. May I say to you that in the beginning was the Word, Christ, in the beginning. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. Three statements. He was in the beginning, He was with God, and He was God. Now, the same was in the beginning with God. He repeats it. Now, will you listen to this? All things were made by Him... And without him was not anything made that was made. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one who is the agent of creation. Those little baby hands in Bethlehem could have pushed this universe out of existence and started all over again. He was the creator. Now, again, that's repeated, in fact, several times, and I can only turn to one other passage, and that's in Colossians. And I hope this morning that the members of certain cult are listening. They generally do listen, and I hope they are today. Who, verse 15 of Colossians 1, I don't have time to go into detail, but it says, Who is the image of the invisible God? And that word for image here means that he fills out all that God is. It means, frankly, that he is God. He is, as Paul develops in Colossians, in him dwelleth all the pleroma, the fullness of God. It's bodily. He's God. When you look at Jesus Christ, you're looking at God. Now... He's the firstborn of every creature. Does that mean he's created? No, he's not talking about that. The next verse will make that clear. What he's saying here is this, that he does not fit in to creation at all. You have to go back and start with him. He is the firstborn. He's the one that started it. He is the one that created it. There would have been no creation without Christ. Let me read on, for he makes that clear. For by him were all things created, all things, 
that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible things and invisible things. You and I haven't seen anything yet. Invisible. Whether they be thrones, dominions, or principalities, or powers, this created host, we call them angels, created intelligences of God. All things were created by him. That's repeated for emphasis and for him. May I say the one that walked here 1,900 years ago was the creator of this universe. He walked on the earth that he had made. Martha Snell Nicholson, whom I had the privilege of baptizing and receiving into the membership of this church before she died, wrote this little poem about that time. Will you listen to this? I fall to trembling when I think of how he made the blood-tipped thorns that marred his brow. He made the very cross on which he died, the cruel shining steel that pierced his side. And not a man of all that jeering crew could draw a breath unless he will them to. It was the Creator who came to this earth 1,900 years ago, the one who'd made this universe. May I say, when you see that, you have no problem with the virgin birth of Christ. You are hackling about a little thing until you see him as the creator in the Old Testament. The second thing, he is the judge. He is the judge. He made this statement when he was here, for the Father judgeth no man but he hath committed all judgment to the Son. And that means all judgment. If you go back into the Old Testament, you will find that the Lord Jesus Christ was the one who judged. He is the, the angel of Jehovah in the Old Testament. And on one occasion, an Assyrian host, a nation that had been coming and pounding against the northern kingdom, until finally they devastated it and they took that kingdom into captivity. Into their capital city had come a man by the name of Jonah. He had preached repentance. And that city and that nation at that time was delivered because God delivered them and God saved them because they turned to him. But these people were brutal people. Another generation came up who knew not God, who did not want to know God, who turned their back on the God of Jonah. And then this Assyrian host came down against Jerusalem, the southern kingdom. And God said through Isaiah the prophet, You go tell Hezekiah not to worry. That army will not will not shoot an arrow into the city. Have you ever stopped to think of an army of 160,000 camped around the walls of Jerusalem, all of them with bows and arrows and all of them trigger happy? Don't you know that some soldier's going to pull a bow and shoot an arrow in the city? And if any one of the 160,000 does that, he'll disprove the word of God. But not one of them pulled a bow. Not one of them let an arrow fly. And God says they'll never enter this city. Why? Because a nation, a pagan nation, that had had the word of God and turned their back upon God, God says I'll judge it. And that night, Second Kings 19, verse 35, it came to pass that night, that the angel of the Lord went out. The Lord Jesus Christ went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred, fourscore, and five thousand. And I always liked this. When they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpse. 
When they got up the next morning, they found out they were dead. But the thing is, they didn't get up. When Israel got up the next morning, the Assyrians didn't get up because God had judged that nation. God had judged, yes. Who went through the angel of Jehovah? Who is the angel of Jehovah? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, the Father judgeth no man. He's committed all judgment to the Son. And you see him out young in the future. He's coming forth to this earth again to judge. And the most frightful judgment of all is when the lost are gathered before the great white throne and one sitting on that throne before whom his creation will roll up like a scroll because of his holiness. May I say he's the judge, and you find him moving here in judgment. He is the one that went through Egypt that night. He's the one that judged the firstborn in the land of Egypt. God had a right to claim the firstborn and that night he claimed them. And my friend, he's still today walking in the midst of the lampstand. And my first pastor, I buried a precious, a precious young fella, fine physically. His mother said, I refuse to dedicate him to God for the mission field. The angel of the Lord still goes through the camp. And if you think today this one who died on a cross is some sort of a sob sister and that today he's not dealing with the children of man, wrong. He's the judge. And he moves through the Old Testament as the angel of Jehovah. And he judges. He's yet to judge. May I move on to the last? He's the Savior. He's the Savior. Down yonder in the land of Egypt, the children of Israel were groaning, complaining. They needed a deliverer. There was a man who wanted to be the deliverer. He went out one day and he was a prince. He would have been the next Pharaoh. He saw one of his brethren being beaten and he interfered. The fact of the matter is he murdered the Egyptian. And he thought that his brethren, when he did that, would rally to him and he'd lead them out of the land of Egypt. They didn't rally. They didn't move. They said, we're afraid of you. We're afraid you'll do for us what you did to the Egyptian. And Moses fled from the land of Egypt. He went down into the desert. And for 40 years, down in the desert, God trained him. And then one day, the Lord Jesus Christ appeared to him. The angel of Jehovah there is definitely identified as God. And said to him, Moses, take off your shoes, you're on holy ground. And friends, if when you and I get into the presence of Christ, there'll be no buddy-buddy stuff. There's not going to be this togetherness. We're going to be down on our faces before him. Moses, take off your shoes. You're on holy ground. Moses took off his shoes. And this one said, Moses, I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Isaac. I'm the God of Jacob. I'm the God that called Abraham out of her of the Chaldees because I wanted to save man. That's my primary purpose in calling a nation, is to save man. I appeared unto Isaac, and I confirmed that promise with him. I want to save man. I appeared unto Jacob at Bethel, and I said, Jacob, you're running away from home, but you're not running away from God. You're to be my man, because from you and through you and in you, I'm going to bring the same. He's coming. He's coming. And the checkered career of that man would cause any right-thinking person to get rid of him and discard him, but not God, for he is a Savior. And he saved Jacob. 
made him Israel a prince with God. And now he appears to Moses and he says, Moses, I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Isaac. I'm the God of Jacob. I've come down to save. I'm in the saving business. I hear my people groaning down yonder. I hear them. I have seen the whip of the taskmaster upon their back. I want to save them. And I'll use you, Moses. And I'll send you back to be the human deliverer because I am not yet ready to come in person. But in the fullness of time, he came forward, made of a woman made under the law, to deliver them that are under the law. And he came a saying. That's the reason he came to this earth. He came in order that he might be a Savior. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He was the Savior in the Old Testament. He is the Savior to, in the New Testament. He's the Savior today. He's the one that walked through the, the Garden of Eden and says, Adam, where are you? Oh, Adam, where are you? I'm looking for you. Man's never been looking for God. Christ has always been looking for man. He's the judge, yeah. And my friend, my Christian friend today, why are you worrying about Mr. Khrushchev? Is he, is he frightening you today with his firecrackers? May I say to you, God will stop him when he's ready. God will stop him. The Lord Jesus Christ is the judge. When he's through with him, down he goes. He's the judge. He's still on the throne. But he's the Savior today. He's the Savior. He died on a cross. He died on a cross to deliver us, not out of Egypt but out of sin. And he said to Moses, I'm not only going to bring them out of Egypt, I'm going to bring them into the land. And his salvation is not just a salvation from hell. It's a salvation under heaven. He says, if I take them out, I'll take them in. And today, he's a Savior. He's a Savior because he came down here and redeemed men, sold under sin, sold under the law, slaves of sin, Lost man, troubled man, men under tension, men that have failed, he came to save. Save them to the uttermost. That's his business. He says, judgment is my strange work. I don't like it. But salvation, that's what I want to do. And that's the reason he's so patient in these days. That's the reason he's so patient with you. And he's so patient with me. I close with this. A little boy in a family that every summer went up into the lake region of Minnesota to spend the summer. This little fella, one winter, worked all winter making a, a little boat that he wanted to sail on this lake. And he put all of his thought and his time and all of his interest into it, and he honestly he just loved the little boat. And he would try it in the bathtub to his mother's dismay. He'd try it elsewhere. But then it came summertime and they went to the lake in the north and the boy got him a string and put on it and let the boat go out. But the first day he put it out, they, there was a wind. I guess a wind like we had last night in Whittier, not Pasadena. And the little fella, the boat got loose broke from the stream, and he just stood down on the shore weeping as he saw it go out of sight, and he thought he'd never see it again. A few days later, he was walking down in the little lake village by a second-hand shop, and he looked and he saw a boat in the window. It looked familiar. He looked carefully. It was his boat. <laughs> Somebody had found it and, and had brought it and sold it to the second-hand dealer. And he went in and he said to the, to the man, he says, how much is that boat in the window? The man says, you can have that boat for two dollars. And the little boy says, I'll be right back. He went home and got his piggy bank and he broke into it 
and he got two dollars. And he came back and he bought it. When the man held it, handed it to him, the little fellow held it up and he looked at it with great pride. He says, you're mine now. I made you and I bought you. The Lord Jesus Christ made you and he bought you with a price. You belong to him. And my friend, as Augustine said, we are restless until we rest in him. This morning, do you need him? He made you. That's the reason he knows you so well. <laughs> he made you. And he was down here 1,900 years ago in human flesh. He knows exactly what you're going through. And he came to be a savior. That's all. When he was here, he wouldn't even judge. A man came to him and says, My brother's taken my inheritance from me. Do something about it. He says, Man, who made me a judge? I don't judge you now. May I say to you, he's a Savior today. And you ought to thank God that he hasn't moved in in judgment. He will someday. But today, he's a Savior. He created you. He made you. He bought you with a price, even his precious blood he shed for you on the cross. What have you done about it? Let us pray. As we this morning come to this final moment of the service, may I say my part is over. I always wish that I had presented him better than I do, but... I did the best I could. I presented him this morning as he is. He's the creator. He's the savior. And if you won't have him as savior, he'll be your judge. You can't escape him. But this morning, he's gracious. This morning, he's a savior. This morning, he wants to save you because he made you. And he loves you. He gave himself for you. Jesus is Creator, Savior, and for some, Judge. Who is He to you today? Dr. McGee's message demands a response. If He's your Savior today, then thank Him. Rest in the reality that the One who made you has bought you with the price of His own blood. You belong to Him. If you've not yet made the decision to follow Jesus, then today you have a choice to make. Say yes or say no. But the choice is made in your decision this moment. And we're praying today that you choose Jesus as your Savior. If you'd like to know more about the Bible and what it says about salvation through Jesus Christ, then please go to ttb.org and click on How Can I Know God? You'll find several free resources from Dr. McGee that will explain this beautiful gift of salvation. On ttb.org, you can also order a CD copy of this sermon, The Man Who Lived Before He Was Born. Or you can call us to order a copy at 1-800-65-BIBLE. And when you contact us, will you let us know the station that you're listening to? Or if you listen online with maybe our mobile app, and we'd love to know that as well. If God has blessed you through through the Bible this year, please consider how he would like to use you in supporting it, both prayerfully and financially. We rely fully on God's provision through his people to sustain this ministry day by day. If you'd like your gift today to be counted towards 2014 donations, then please either call our office Monday through Wednesday with your gift, give online by midnight on Wednesday evening, or drop your gift in the mail and be sure to have the check dated and postmarked in 2014. Here's our contact info. Online, go to ttb.org. You can also call us at 1-800-65-BIBLE, or you can write to Box 7100. Pasadena, California, 91109. In Canada, Box 25325. London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. The Bible Bus is back on the road this week, continuing our study in the book of Hebrews in our five-year journey through the whole Word of God. I'm your host, Steve Schwetz, praying that God will bless you with peace and joy as you walk with the Lord today. This program has been brought to you by the faithful friends and supporters of the worldwide ministry of Through the Bible Radio Network.